So we found an orthogonal basis in two ways. One way is we basically just kind of guessed at S and T values using the definition. And that was kind of cumbersome. And then the other way we did it was a Gram-Schmidt process, which was also tedious and cumbersome. So there's not a sort of super fast way to do it. Uh, let's use our process one more time. But what I'm going to do is, just like in the Gram-Schmidt process, I'm going to insist that our first vector in our orthogonal basis is the first vector in our original basis. So I'm going to go with this as our first vector right here. And then what we're going to do is compute the second vector. So I'm going to choose S is 0 and T is 1 so that we get this vector right here. So we're not going to recreate the whole wheel. We'll just go with Let's see. I think this would be a good line to use. I'll switch over to purple this time. So we're picking our first vector to be 1, 1, 0. So that means T1 is going to be 1 and S1 is going to be 0. I'm looking right there. So I want, I'm insisting that our first vector in our orthogonal basis is the first vector in our original basis, just like Gram-Schmidt uh, uses. And then what we're going to do is figure out what second vector would we have to get using our, uh, the algebra that we had set up. So I'm choosing T1 to be 1, S1 to be 0, and then I'm going to use the, what's the easiest one? I think we can just use the bottom line right there so we don't we redo the least amount of work right there. So the bottom had the vectors, the two basis vectors already plugged in, and then I'm just going to plug in T is, uh, T1 is 1, S1 is 0. So I'll re rewrite that equation. So we got 2 T1 T2 minus 2 S1 T2 minus 2 T1 S2 plus 5 s1 s2 equals 0 and now we will just fill in uh, all the s1s are going to be 0 so they're going to completely cancel out and then the t1s are 1 so it's 2 t2 minus 2 s2 equals 0 so we have t2 equals s2 so whatever we choose for T2, we have to choose the same thing for S2. What would be a, the only bad value that would definitely not, well, what would be an obvious value that would not work? Zero. Zero. So it would satisfy this equation, but it would break our linear independence. It would be putting a zero vector into our basis. So obviously, we can't choose zero. Let's go with, how about one? That's pretty easy. So we'll choose one and one right here. And then the basis vector we're going to get when we go with 1, 1. I'm looking in the upper left corner right there. So this will be our second basis vector. We'll call it B2. So we're going 1 times 1, 1, 1 plus 1 times negative 2, 0, 1. So that is 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. And 0 plus 1 is 1. All right, so that would be our second basis vector. And of course, our first ba basis vector was the 1, 1, 0. I wanted to use the same uh, vector from our original basis. All right, so first question, are these orthogonal? How do we determine orthogonal? Dot product. Dot product. So we're going to check. So are they orthogonal? So 
negative one plus one plus zero equals zero. So they are orthogonal. They are independent because they are not multiples. Anytime you have three or more, it's much more tedious to check independence. You actually have to do, you can't just look and then judge in two seconds. All right, so we got orthogonal and independent, and there's two, so they have to be a basis. Just by the dimension matching, they're independent. All right, let's compare these two vectors that we just got to the uh, ones we got from Graham Schmidt. So we get the same first vector, we did that on purpose. Our second vector, negative one, one, one. Oh, look at that. Magic. All right, this should happen if there's exactly two vectors, if your dimension is two, if your dimension is three, you're going to probably make too many arbitrary choices so you won't get the exact same uh, set. Uh, plus, I think if you're doing three vectors, your algebra would be very tedious because you'd be picking, you'd be making lots of choices on coefficients, whereas we had four choices maximum. We really uh, <coughs> pick some easy values for those. All right, so I gave you the Gram-Schmidt process for how to do this. So let's move on from uh, getting orthogonal bases. We're going to go back to diagonalization. So we'll continue right in this section here. So I'm going to write down the procedure. Uh, well, let's write, let's review a couple of things we need. What is a definition of diagonalizable? Of course, diagonalizable is not in here. It just means you're similar to a diagonal matrix. I mean, I'll just rewrite it at the bottom. It's faster than digging it up from another section. So a real fast way to write that is A squiggle D. So that means A is similar to D, uh, where D is a diagonal matrix. So what is a diagonal matrix? It has zeros above and below the diagonal. So it's got zeros above and below the diagonal, and the only non-zeros would appear in the diagonal. You can still have zeros in the diagonal, but you have to have zeros off the diagonal. So that's a diagonal matrix. And what does squiggle mean? Similar. So squiggle means similar. So what that means, there exists matrix P such that A equals P, I want to get the letters right. Is it P inverse DP? I, I know we can switch all these around. I can put the P's next to the A, but I think I showed you that already. So we multiply on the left by P, multiply on the right by P inverse, and we have that relationship right there. So you're P, P inverse can appear on either side. Uh, and 
I'm going to let Q equal P inverse. So I could rewrite this as Q inverse A Q equals D. And I can rewrite the top equation up there as A equals Q D Q inverse. So what that means, it doesn't really matter which of these four you use, as long as you multiply by matrix, matrix inverse on either side. Now I don't know which of these is the original definition, but they're all equivalent. So any one of them will work. I think we're going to be using either that or, nope, not the second one, that or that. We're going to be using one of those two. All right, so that is matrix. So we're not going to go over the definition of is, <laughs> even though that was done a while ago. OK, so we're ready for our procedure for diagonalizing a matrix. And we are in section 5.2 of the Anton book. All right, so one thing that we saw already, it involves the eigenvalues. So our matrix D is going to contain all the eigenvalues going down the diagonal. Uh, so step one, we have to determine if a is diagonalizable. Now we had some equivalent conditions for this. So let's find those in the notes and then pick the easiest or some of the easiest. Oh, we didn't have to go very far. So I'm just scrolling up. The following are equivalent right at the top of the board. It says A is diagonalizable. That's equivalent to the union of all the basis vectors of the eigenspaces of A contains n vectors. Uh, or each eigenvalue's geometric multiplicity equals the algebraic multiplicity. So I think 2 is pretty good right there. So let's rephrase that. So if we get n, so So A has to be square, so let's just say the dimension is N. So this happens not just when, but exactly when. When there are N indep linearly independent. eigenvectors. So in order to make that determination, we need to compute the eigenvalues, then the eigenspaces, which will give us a basis for each eigenspace. And then if the number of eigenvectors is n, then we can diagonalize. So if you get, uh, you know, sometimes when you do eigenvalues, you'll get like 2, but it's twice. Does that immediately cancel diagonalizable? Because you'll get basically two eigen vectors. So I'm planning to do an example where we get one eigen, uh, two eigen values, but in a th three dimensional, uh, three dimensional space. But the one value gives us a two dimensional eigen space. So you don't need n different eigenvalues, but you need n independent eigenvectors. Okay. So one eigenvalue can lead to a, multi a more than one dimensional eigenspace. Okay. 
So another way to think of it is the sum of your eigenspace dimensions equals n. That would be another equivalent condition. So basically, you need enough eigenvectors to fill up a matrix. All right, so we're going to compute eigenvalues and then eigenvectors. So that was step one. So step two obviously only happens if you're diagonalizable. So if you're not diagonalizable, you stop. You can't do step two. But if you did get n eigenvectors, so this is a step I don't think I wrote before. So the matrix P, and we are going to be using Well, we'll actually be using the one I didn't put a box around, that one right there. So that's the one we'll be using. So this matrix P is going to be P1, P2, Pn. Where these P's are the eigenvectors. Ks are the eigenvectors, and our matrix D so it's lambda 1, whoa, these are numbers, so D is a diagonal matrix, so we got lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, and of course zeros off the diagonal. The order is important, if you notice you have to match lambda 1 its eigen uh, vector is P1, lambda 2, its eigen vector is P2, et cetera, et cetera. So you do need to make sure that the order is correct right there. Uh, you can uh, swap these two, but you have to swap those two. So you don't have to have the same order as uh, somebody else is doing this, but your P and your D matrix have to correspond in terms of eigenvalues and vectors. So there are, basically there's multiple ways to find this decomposition. And yep, that's basically it right there. That's P and that's D. And step three. So the matrix P inverse A P will be diagonal uh, will be a diagonal matrix. And specifically it'll be the diagonal matrix D. All right, so let's do an example where we're going to do all these steps. So it's going to take a little while. We're going to need to get some eigenvalues, then vectors. So our matrix A, 0, 0, negative 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0, 3. All right, so all the steps are on the board. So step one, get the characteristic polynomial and compute your lambda values. So I'll give you a minute head start and then I will do one part at a time and then give you another minute and then do the next part. So it's a good time for questions if you have them.
I'm going to expand on column two just to have zeros more easily. But do as you wish. So I got lambdas 2 repeated twice, and then lambdas 1 appearing once. So any algebra determinant questions? So when you are going to find your determinant, remember you can use any row, any column that you like. So I always go use the column with the most zeros or the row with the most zeros. I was about to use row 1, and then I saw column 2 was even better. So I want column two. All right, how do we get the, I, we'll go with a lambda's two first. How do I get the eigenspace? So we'll be using the eigenvalue, so it'll be a minus 2i. But what about this matrix is the eigenspace? It's null. Yeah, it's null space. So that's super important. So it's a null space of this matrix. So we got a minus 2i. We are looking for the null space here. So I'll be augmenting with zeros. two row operations, then I'll make a row swap. So any row reduction questions? How many free variables? Two frees. So we got those two zeros I circled are both free. We use X, Y, Z. So Y and Z are free. So we'll let Y equal T, Z equal S. 
and our first equation is x plus z equals zero. So that's x equals negative z, which is negative s. y equals t, and z equals positive s. So if we write it in vector form, so it's minus sts. Separate the s's. So we got negative s zero s plus zero t zero. We can pick any s and any t that gives us independence, but I think there's pretty obvious combinations of s and t. So we'll go with s is one, t is zero for our first, and then s is zero, t is one for our second. So that'll avoid fractions and give us, the vectors couldn't be much nicer than they are right now. So we'll just go with those two. And again, we can choose any two linearly independent vectors with different s and t values. So the only restriction is they need to be independent. So you can't choose S and T both zero. I'll give you a zero vector. Uh, so we're choosing two pairs of S, T values. Giving two eigenvectors. That need to be linearly independent. Now generally when you get it into the form that I originally wrote down here, you're just basically going to pick the first and second vector independently. So the first eigenvector will be the first one, second one will be the second one. Alright, so there are two eigenvalues. All we have to do is get the eigen, or two eigenvectors. All we need is the eigenvector for lambda is one. Alright, so find E1 right now. And you should be getting one free variable this time. If you do have a proper eigenvalue, you should always get at least one free variable no matter what. If you get zero free variables, something went wrong. You either don't have an eigenvalue or you made some other mistake. So I'm only going to do that single, well, those two row operations there, because 
well, I could put a positive one in the first row. So I guess we'll, we'll do that. Multiply by negative one. Now, column two is already as good as it's going to get, right there. And if I look in column three, if I try to knock the two out, I'm going to mess up the zero next to it. So there's no more reduction that's going to uh, make these equations nicer. So we see our free variable there. So we're going to let z equal t. We got x plus 2z equals 0, y plus z equals 0. So we x equals negative 2z, which is negative 2t, y equals negative z, which is negative t, and then z is just positive t. Wouldn't the second equation be 0, 1, negative 1 because you added row 1 to it? Yes, yeah, 0, 1, negative 1, negative. Yeah, so our y equals regular t. So our null space is all multiples of negative 2, 1, 1. So we'll pick the easiest multiple, which is probably a positive 1 for t. Negative 1 would have worked just as well. So either way. And I think we were calling this, this would be the third eigenvector. So this would be p3 in that notation that I was writing in the procedure. mean that lambda 3 is our uh, eigenvalue of 1. So that's P3. And I'm just going to rewrite in the lambda and P notation up here. So here we got P1 is negative 1, 0, 1. And lambda 1 is 2. And our second eigenvector is P2, 0, 1, 0. Also corresponds to lambda 2 equals 2. Alright, so I think we have all the pieces we need to... So we finished step 1, we got three independent eigenvectors, so that's exactly what we need to be diagonalizable, so ready to move to step 2. I think we have all the pieces to put this together. So our matrix P is going to be P1, P2, P3. So P1, negative 1, 0, 1. P2, 0, 1, 0, P3, negative 2, 1, 1. So that's P right there. Diagonal matrix is going to be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, with zeros off the diagonal. So that is 2. 2, 1. Alright, so let's see if this procedure actually worked for our example. So in order to check it, I need to get P inverse. So I'll just go back up real quick to step 3. So what I want to do is actually make sure that P inverse AP is equal to the matrix D. So I need to get P inverse. How do we invert a matrix? So we augment with the identity. So we need to find P inverse. And the way that we find inverses, we line up P with the identity. We're going to do a bunch of row operations to get the identity on the left. And we will have P inverse on the right. So that always works for as long as you're invertible, that's how you get an inverse. All right, so do that right now. I'll give you another minute head start. Uh, and if you, when you do have this, then compute that P inverse AP.
right, so any questions on these row operations or any disagreements? So we're going to look at P inverse AP. We're multiplying three matrices. Multiplication is not commutative. If it was, basically the P would cancel P inverse. But we know we can't do that. We do get associativity. What that means is I can multiply P inverse times A and then multiply P or I could go AP first and then multiply by P inverse. So it doesn't matter which way you go. Um, I'll just go the way I had it in there the first time, which is multiply on the two on the left first and then we'll take care of the right. So we're going to cross and down. So I have zero plus zero plus two and then 0 plus 0 plus 0 and then negative 2 plus 0 plus 6 is 4 0 plus 1 plus 1 is 2 uh, 0 2 0 is 2 and then negative 2 plus 1 plus 3 is positive 2 and last row, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, negative 3, is negative 1. And then bring down that third matrix. times negative 1 is negative 2, plus 4 is 2, and 0, 0, 0, negative 4, 0, plus 4 is 0, uh, second row, negative 2, plus 0, plus 2 is 0, 0, 2, 0 is 2, negative 4 plus 2 plus 2 is 0. Now we got negative 1 plus positive 1 plus 0 plus negative 1 is 0. 0, 0, 0. 2, 0, negative 1 is 1. All right, finish just in time. So that's exactly what we were expecting. That's our matrix D right there. So we just showed that it's diagonalizable because we found the matrix uh, that it's similar to and then found the matrix P and checked it all.